Well, welcome everybody. Uh, so I sat through the morning session and uh, I just got more and more excited about giving this talk because I really feel strongly that one of the things we're missing in the direct primary care movement is data to prove what the hell we all know we accomplish day to day in our clinics. Um, a little bit on my own background, I am a concierge physician. I started doing concierge medicine in 2005. And as we go through my slides, if we can bring it up. As we go through the slides, one of the things you'll see is, you know, direct primary care was illegal in the state of Nebraska. So we had to do the old-fashioned Garrison Bliss approach. We had to actually lead this through our legislative body um, to be able to... Oh, great. Oh, thanks. We had to be able to lead it through the legislative body to be able to uh, actually make direct primary care legal, which was a phenomenal experience to have in life just from a standpoint of starting to understand what goes on at that legislative level and to have a better idea um, to be able to help lead change inside the state for some other things that I'll, I'll get to here eventually. So some of the learning objectives uh, I'll leave for your perusal. Obviously the slides are all available online. But, but I thought what would be really helpful here since I'm one of the first speakers and God forbid I should have looked, I wish Jeff had his talk out on video before he gave it. Uh, hell of an act to follow. But I have a few questions that I just want to get from the audience perspective and I think it'll be helpful for even all the other speakers to follow. So uh, please take some time and try and answer these because it'll give us a better idea I think where to spend some time and address. So what kind of a pr uh, practice do you presently operate? Are you still in fee-for-service and you're just here exploring DPC? Are you only a fee-for-service but planning to convert for DPC? Are you practicing DPC already but have been doing so for less than two years? Are you practicing DPC and have been doing so for more than two years? I'll give you a little bit of time. Well, those are impressive. So we've got it, uh, we're all over the map, and, and that's a great thing. Once again, I, I think that I would expect I could come back and have a conversation here five years from now, and I hope those numbers would almost look the same, except obviously the room, I hope, is about four times larger, of which I want you to know I was at the uh, DPC Summit in Kansas City when we were in the process. We had just led uh, the legislative DPC bill through the state of Nebraska, and I would actually say this crowd is about four times as large. So awesome that you guys are all here and great to see it growing. Okay, so next is for those who are presently in DPC clinics, what type of clinic do you operate? Are you doing both fee-for-service and DPC and functioning what we call a hybrid model? Are you pure DPC or are you doing something else? So about three-fourths are doing just pure DPC. Fantastic. For the DPC clinics, do you presently work with employer groups? Not currently, and I don't plan to. Not currently, but I'd like to. I am working with employer groups, but right now I have less than 10. Or I am working with employer groups, and I've been very successful, and I have more than 10 employer groups I'm working with. Okay, fantastic. So about 10% of you have uh, been what I would say in the employer arena, very successful. Um, and then really about a third and a third, not currently, but would like to. Yes, in working less than 10 and about 20% are not planning on working with employer groups. Fantastic. Okay. So a quick summary of Strata Healthcare, once again, founded in April of 2016, which really 
That was when the governor signed legislative bill LB817 for the state that made doing direct primary care legal. We uh, otherwise had some very special insurance laws in our books. We were what I would call an insurance-dominated state where if a physician accepted cash for anything that could have been covered by their insurance policy, they were then deemed an indemnified insurance company, and obviously physicians were not indemnified, therefore you were violating state insurance laws. And they would come shut you down and give you a nice fine, and in all actuality, if they wanted to prosecute, it was listed as a felony. Therefore, not many physicians were doing that. We have, pre we have practice locations right now throughout the state of Nebraska and into Iowa. We function mostly. We do have some pure DPC locations, but I look at myself right now as a lifeline to family physicians in the state of Nebraska and Iowa and other places from a standpoint of right now they're in there and they're slugging it out on a daily basis and I go to them with no affiliation charges and just say, let me start sending you DPC patients. We're going to go work on getting employer groups and I want to start sending you DPC patients. So that's kind of how our model has worked in the DPC hybrid. And right now in the Strata model, 71% of our patients come from employer groups. However, that also means despite really little to no marketing in Omaha and Iowa, and yet 29% of our patients have found us anyway. So everybody has seen this joke. We just played with the slides a little. So why employer groups? Well, I, I think you heard a little bit about this this morning, and I, I am a firm believer. Um, you know, if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, you can expect the same results. So I am a recovering program director. I ran an internal medicine residency program for 11 years uh, at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. It's a phenomenal place to go and get primary care education. And what I saw was in my graduating class, 11 of my 13 fellow residents went into primary care, and today, and when I left, very few. Most are choosing, obviously, specialty care. 55% of our patients, 55% of the people in the United States are getting their insurance paid by their employers. They're locked into an employer plan. I think if we eliminate these people from playing in the DPC game, I think we are really limiting our ability for this to be a true success story inside of helping to save primary care. So I am a firm believer that we have to continue to educate the employers, the employer groups. We have to continue to find great brokers like Dan Moylan, who we've hosted in Omaha, Nebraska before to speak with us. Um, Holmes Murphy and others. I think we have to continue to find those people and work with them to help find these employers that are ready to play with us. So I just want to talk a little bit about some of the groups that we're presently working with just to give you an idea of what that might look like when you're thinking about businesses. They could be almost anything. We have a large insurance company in all actual, in actuality. They have over a thousand employees. But if you're going to go after that, that's what I call the big fish in the market. They're a little bit more difficult. Quite honestly, <clears throat> we met with, we really wanted to have a big splash with this employer group. We met with them damn near employee by employee. We would take 20 employees at a time, but I'd have three Strata employers there running that meeting. And so we ran a lot of meetings to get through 1,000 employees at 20 at a time to try and educate them on what direct primary care was, why we're trying to lead change, and why your company wants this as a part of your health care benefit. And then there's a mid-sized plumbing company that we have. That one has about 120 employees. Their DPC, or their direct primary care plan, is not integrated with their insurance at all. Similar to the large insurance company, uh, they had a high deductible that they would pair with the direct primary care. The mid-sized plumbing company basically says, you know what, we're a fully insured already. I'm not ready to go to a self-insured market, but I really love what you're doing to improve health care and to try and lead change, and I want to add this as a benefit uh, for my employees. And then we have another mid-sized plumbing company with about 140 employees that we converted from being a full uh, service uh, insurance to become a self-insured. And it's taking them to a self-insured. Along with that, we added DPC into their self-insured to try and help save the employer uh, some money on their spend. And then we also, just as some of the others, these are the ones I think are the easiest businesses to go get. And that's the small vehicle collision repair. He has less than 50 employees. 
uh, explaining to them that direct primary care is not insurance. He presently doesn't offer insurance to his employees, but he sees this as a great value add to at least offer a benefit to help make him an employer of choice in the community. So there are all kinds of different avenues, different businesses, different ways to approach, kind of like you've heard Dan and others talk about. You know, it's really trying to better understand the employers from a standpoint of how can we help you, but also some of that is also uh, being able to paint a better picture, and that's really where I want to spend my time today. At Strata Healthcare, I think data's a big deal. Um, you know, I, I, just flat out, I didn't get into direct primary care to make money. I do that through my concierge practice. Uh, but I think data is a huge deal in direct primary care, and if we can't prove this concept, uh, to employer groups, then that 55% of the market, that doesn't include our Medicare. So if you then remove Medicare and the 55% that are employed, it doesn't leave a lot of people for us to take care of in the direct primary care realm. So I think that is a big deal because that's what the employers want to see. The employers, this is something they're already spending a lot of money on. And when you come to them and say, oh, I can take care of your patients and it's going to cause X and I'll do a great job and I'm going to improve their health and in the end you're going to spend less money, I think. I think we have to prove it, and that's why I think you see some slow response on some of the employers. So we think data is a big deal, and quite honestly, it's where all my money goes. So I'm here to prove the concept for the rest of you. I'm the early adopter that spends all the money so that the rest of you hopefully get to follow us in and use our data to run with. And by the way, our data is available on our website, stratahealthcare.com, so feel free to go, use it, take our slides, go approach your businesses, and go get them. And I'm going to try and help you see how we do that. So here's some of the metrics we follow. We talk about per member per month health, per member per month in their uh, prescription spread, how, what's your percentage generic, generic versus brand, so on and so on and so on. We are following all kinds of metrics. But what I don't want you to think for one second is that I would actually ask a doctor to do anything else different than take great care of an individual patient. We go get this data ourselves. We do it by mining the EMRs that you are using if you sign up for Strata Healthcare, and that is what allows us to go get this data. So we are not a company that's asking you to fill out extra paperwork, do extra things to get this. This is us spending the money on analytics to go get the data. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about it. So Burton Plumbing. This is Mark. Mark owns Burton Plumbing. If you can see the van, you can see it's actually his picture on the side of the van also. Mark is a, is a fabulous employer. He loves his employees. He just wanted to do something special for his employees. So Mark is one of these people that basically when we went and met with, and, I, and, there, and there are always some ulterior motives, I'm sure. When you learn about plumbing in Omaha, Nebraska, you'll find that there's only one city that has more restricted plumbing covenants to become a master plumber, and that's New York City, and Omaha's right behind them. So when you have master plumbers that work for you, they're gold. I mean, you, they're hard to find. And they constantly want to jump from company to company, right, to get a better opportunity. They're being mined from each other. So Mark liked the idea of being able to offer an extra benefit to his employees with Strata Healthcare. And what we decided to do was this was going to be a great data group. So we did biometric data on every employee. Whether they chose to enroll in Strata Healthcare or not, they all got the same biometric data, and we hit every one of the employees. And what I want to share with you is some of the data that we then showed when you take direct primary care and apply it to this group, what kind of results did we see? So here's our per member per month medical spend in one year. You can see the non-strata group was at about 568.18, and if you had strata, that spend dropped to $133.04. This is the one that blows the people out of the water. And quite honestly, it's difficult to explain. But I'm here to tell you, this is what you heard a little bit about this morning. When we stop saying we only have eight minutes for this visit, but we start educating the patients on what their problems are, I'm here to tell you, you prescribe a lot less medication. And that's part of what we found. Now, I want you to understand the other thing is if you're going to do this and you're going to go do biometrics on all the patients, don't do it on a Friday. That was lesson number one I learned here. Do you know why? Because I had five critical lab calls that I had to do on Saturday morning. <laughs> right? So I had 
two patients with triglycerides over 2,000. I had a patient with a blood glucose over 500, and I had another patient with a blood glucose over 300. So don't do them on a Friday, because then you're spending your Saturday doing critical lab calls, or Friday night doing critical lab calls. And I will flat out tell you, I, I know from being very involved in this data and the patient care, both of those patients with triglycerides over 2,000 today have normal triglycerides and are on no medications. ED visits per 1,000, do you think employers are impressed by that? Inpatient admit admissions per 1,000? And worker comp injuries. So this was one of those things that, quite honestly, when we were setting up all the metrics to follow, this is not one of them I had picked. It was one somebody else had picked. And yet, it's, it's probably been one of the most impressive things that we find. And, and quite honestly, everybody in the group here gets it when you stop to think about it. And that is, this is one of the unintended consequences of phenomenal primary care and a great patient-physician relationship. What happened here is when the patients got injured at work, they could communicate on their phone directly with their Strata Healthcare provider through a Spruce app, right? So they get on in a HIPAA-compliant mode and they send a thing, hey doc, I sprained my ankle today at work, what should I do? Well, that allows us then to have an intervention prior to them going to a work fit or, God forbid, an emergency room where they'll go with their swollen ankle and say their chest hurts, right? I mean, so it, it just allowed us to be involved from the very beginning. And although we had to fill out work comp paperwork for that, when the employer goes back at the end of that, I can't tell you what it was like to deal with the phone calls from the work comp uh, insurance provider to say, well, we need to get the billing documents on that visit. I'm sorry, there is no billing. No, 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 from the visit. We need to get the billing documents from that visit. There is no billing. This is a direct primary care practice. It was all paid for. We don't do billing documents in this practice. That, that took longer than I think to see the patients was to get them to understand that. So, a little pause. This is where I always like to say, I think we all know that direct primary care is going to get those kind of results or similar results. You know, flat out, in every study, are we going to be able to show that we save that much money, that many inpatient visits, that many ER visits? Hell no. No, I'm not willing to say that. But what I am willing to say is direct primary care is absolutely a future for primary care, and it is absolutely a future that employers should be looking at to save money and improve, improve their employees' health. But wouldn't it be great if somebody actually had the kahunas to get the data to say not only can we save the employer's money, but we could improve the health of the employees along the way? Thank you, Strata Healthcare. Here we go. So here is your direct comparison. One year data, one year data of the patients that were enrolled in Strata versus those patients that elected to stay in their routine healthcare. Not high, same deductible, all the other things, right, that they were in prior um, and did not enroll in Strata. So you can see BMI went up, ours basically remained the same, went a little bit down. Fasting glucose levels, both went down. HDL, ours went up, theirs went down. Diastolic blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure, by the end of that, that's 15 millimeters of mercury a difference. For those of you who read academic studies on hypertension, do you know what they consider a significant change in systolic blood pressure for a study? It's like two millimeters of mercury difference. And that's what many drugs qualify with an FDA study on. We're talking 15 millimeters of mercury difference in blood pressure. Cholesterol number, triglyceride numbers. So as you can see, there is a lot of change and some very positive things in the numbers there. And so you can go to employers and you can talk about Here's what we can do as we add direct primary care to what you're doing. Here's what we think we can do to help affect your cost. But I think most importantly, we have to be looking for those employers that are you know, willing to take a little bit of risk with us because in the beginning, you are asking them to spend some money to do direct primary care. If you've got great brokers that are working with you, some of them figure out how we bake that into bringing down the deductibles. And, and of course, that's the, 
That's the real game, right? The real game is when we get enough data that the brokers and the insurance companies would actually write products around us that say, if you add direct primary care in with this, then it's actually going to cost the employers less money, and that gives us an opportunity then to continue to deliver great care and hopefully save everybody money. And by the way, I, I, my, my number one goal is to see this reverse trend. You saw the data this morning, Scandinavia, right? Norway, 50% of the medical students are choosing primary care and family medicine. Why the hell is that not happening in the United States? Well, it's because our jobs suck, right? I mean, if you want data on what drives medical student decisions, I'll walk you through a little thing that I experienced during my residency program director time, right? Everybody's heard of anesthesia. They seem to do pretty well these days, right? Right? Do you know there was a year the University of Nebraska Medical Center's anesthesia program interviewed one candidate for a position? They interviewed one candidate for a residency position. Would you like to know why? Does anybody remember? It was probably right around the end of the 90s, and uh, there was a huge study that came out of Kaiser Permanente out in California, and it talked about how Kaiser Permanente, Kaiser Permanente was going to go to all nurse, nurse anesthetists inside the ORs, right? And the anesthesia was just going to be to run the nurse anesthetists. Have any of you heard this concept in primary care about uh, how we're going to run our home uh, medical companies, right, that these, uh, we're going to just have a physician up here and we'll have other providers seeing all the patients and then we can involve the physician when somebody is really sick and needs, to, that's what they talked about doing with anesthesia and of course all of a sudden you just see everybody tank in the number of people interviewing for anesthesia because the question is what is the job market going to be like? What's the satisfaction going to be, right? What's the money going to be? We have to get after some of those metrics in internal medicine, in family medicine, in pediatrics, if we want to see the volume of applications increase. And I think that's what we need to get after. I think that direct primary care is the answer. But the sad news is I also think we have a very short period of time to do it, and that's why I'm putting all my money in analytics. Because I think we have a short period of time to do it, or this is all going to be owned by Walgreens, Walmart and CVS, and they're going to own primary care, and we're not going to have an opportunity. So then a, a little bit about our, um, I'm really excited about this, um, our pilot study. So I mentioned early on that we had to lead LB817 uh, through the Nebraska legislature to be able to offer direct primary care in the state of Nebraska. So when we finished and um, we got that signed, I have a pretty good relationship with our governor at the state of Nebraska, and I have some, a pretty good relationship with a couple of the legislative people. And so we didn't stop the conversation about direct primary care. So the next conversation was, what else can we do to help direct primary care grow in the state of Nebraska? And just like my number one side, prove it or lose it, I, I said to the governor and the legislative people we were talking with, and I just said, I think we have to be able to prove the concept. And to be able to prove that, I, I think that we have to be able to do some studies that are going to be able to show that, that people can actually see we are improving health care, we are spending less money, and physician satisfaction goes way up. Those are, those are my thoughts of what happens when you go to direct primary care but I think we have to prove it. So we spent some time and we developed legislative bill LB 1119. And I'm excited to say we hosted a signing ceremony in my office. So in that top picture, you can see I'm the, I'm the only guy who shows up in a pullover and uh, I'm standing next to the governor, uh, uh, that's Pete Ricketts. Standing next to him is the guy who led it through the legislator, uh, Merv Reapy. Uh, Todd Johnson was the very first direct primary care doc in the state of Nebraska. The guy next to him is the uh, leader of Medicaid for the state of Nebraska, who also wants to do a pilot study in direct primary care, but I'll flat out tell you, uh, we're having a very difficult time making that happen, but we're not giving up on it. And then over in the bottom picture all the way to the left is Cliff Robertson, who is the head of CHI. Uh, CHI presently has a direct primary care program where they're taking care of their own employees. So this is a hospital system in the state of Nebraska that has started a direct primary care source and all that direct primary care doc and his nurse practitioner are doing are taking care of the hospital employees. And what's really interesting is I heard Cliff talk about that and it was going to be a pilot study for a year and a half. 
Six months into it, uh, a pilot study with 200 employees. Six months into it, they were taking care of, they opened it up and they were taking care of 1,200 employees within, uh, within six to eight months. Now, why do you think CHI would open it up when it was supposed to be a pilot study for over a year and a half to get data on 200, on 200 employees? Because I think they saw the spending already. I think they saw the results already, and they opened it up to the employees, and today that doc and his nurse practitioner are taking care of more than 1,200 patients. And those patients are all employees or direct family members of those who have CHI benefits. So once again, I kind of think when you see those kinds of people doing those kinds of things, you can start to interpret what the data is showing. So I want to talk then a little bit about what is LB1119. What, did, what are we actually going to do? Um, how many of you here are familiar with ERISA law? Anybody? Are there any lawyers in the group? Oh, fantastic, I got one. So, she can, so you help me if I'm wrong, right? So I just want you to know, I had ERISA law in the back of my brain when we were thinking about LB1119, and I had all of you in the front of my brain when I was thinking about LB1119. So LB1119 is for state employees in the state of Nebraska. So July of 2019, my wife and I, and we have 16 kids, We'll probably take a few of those, and we're going to go with some state people, and we're going to go around to the different major sites in the state where state employees are, and we're going to talk about direct primary care, and the employees get to choose. Do they want to continue with the previous plan, or would they like to participate in a pilot study with direct primary care? The state has put no cap on how many patients we can take care of, and... Um, the idea is that this will be a cost saver for the state. That's really where the pressure is going to get put on us, right? And so the employees will get to enroll. It is a four-year pilot study where Strata Healthcare will have exclusivity for enrolling the patients and taking care of them. And so we're excited about what that means from a standpoint of being able to enroll patients, being able to follow the metrics and the data, and to be able to come back and share with you what we're finding. Uh, the study was originally written for a four-year study, right? And so when they were presenting the bill to me and we were talking about it, I'm like, if you'll give me four years, that's fantastic. But it's not going to take me four years to show you data. Through some of the stuff we're doing right now with the analytics company we're working with, uh, I, 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 you know, quite frankly, I turned to the governor and I said, hey, you'll be able to sit in your, uh, he actually lives in Omaha, Nebraska, not in the governor's mansion, but I said, you'll be able to sit in the governor's mansion in your underwear and be able to log on and you'll be able to say, let's see, for the state employees who are male and above the age of 50, what's our average system? blood pressure. For state employees who are female and have diabetes, what's our average hemoglobin A1C? And it'll all pull up. And what I want you to understand is, once again, that is without doctors doing one bit of coding. It's all us mining the data, and it's why we make sure that each physician or each patient gets a panel of laboratory done every year that's covered in the cost of Strata Healthcare. It allows us to go then mine the data and see where we're at, entering systolic blood pressures and diastolics and all those other things, so it allows us to do the data. So then I asked earlier about ERISA law and the familiarity of that. So is there anybody in this room that doesn't think direct primary care is going to win in this study? Uh, I mean, we're up against traditional health care. I've already shown you what I think we can accomplish, and now what I want you to do is better understand ERISA law and why we would want to do this. So ERISA law actually is another one of those laws that has significant teeth. If you are a, let's say, a CFO or an HR benefits manager for a company where you're taking employees' monies to purchase benefits, like maybe a school system, a county, a city, the state, those kinds of things, and you spend that money in a non-fiduciary way, meaning you're picking the best thing that's for the employees, if you don't do that, you're violating ERISA law. So what I want you to understand is once Strata Healthcare proves this with the state of Nebraska, my expectation is that every school system, every city employee, every state employee, all of those become a gold mine for you to be able to offer direct primary care. That's what we're trying to prove in our state study. So Strata Healthcare is very excited and passionate about direct primary care. We're 
phenomenally excited about the future of it. I'm spending a lot of money to try and prove this concept so that hopefully I can come back here in five years and we can talk about all these people we're taking care of in those systems. So I firmly believe in what you heard this morning. We need a railroad track of how to do it. I love the question from the Alabama doctor of 900. I've got a chicken factory in my town. How do I go get those employees? Ask those of us who have done it. Use our data. We're here to help. We're not here to hinder. We're not here to hide what we're doing. We want to help grow the practice of direct primary care because it should be the future of our health care. And I love the statement. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We need to all be involved in this. We shouldn't be try to limit. There isn't one right way to do direct primary care. We can all do this together and yet still be a car in the train for somebody to link on to, right? We need the brokers behind us. We need the insurance companies to better understand this because if we think we're going to do this without insurance companies better understanding us, I, I don't think that's right. Does that mean we need to get in bed and marry them? No, it doesn't. But it does mean I think they need to understand what direct primary care is. Are we a threat to the insurance industry? Absolutely not. I, I know a lot of you might think we are. We are not a threat to the insurance industry. And the reason I think we're not a threat to the insurance industry is because they have drastically failed at primary care and they know that. They'd love us to take it away from them. And if you don't believe me, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Nebraska has opened a direct primary care clinic in Omaha, Nebraska. Do you know why? Because they want to better understand it themselves. So I'm here to tell you, I'm not going to get married to them. I'm not going to get in bed with them. But I'm sure as hell going to try and educate them so they better understand I'm not a threat to you. I'm here to help you go get businesses. Right? So we're working with a large insurance company for the state of Nebraska pilot study. So I think all of that becomes very important. I'm around all weekend. My website is on the, uh, on the slides. Please feel free to ask me any questions, anything like that. You know, once again, I really can't emphasize enough the us doing it all together. For those of you who might be somewhat familiar with the concierge medicine market, we've got a huge opportunity from a standpoint of Roamed is doing that exactly for the concierge market. This is what I see we need a wraparound in DPC. Similar to what Roamed is doing in concierge medicine, we need that where all of us in DPC come together and say, how do we wrap each other up and help each other out? Hey, Joel, I've got some uh, employees in Omaha, Nebraska. Can you take care of them? Hey, Tom, I've got some in Colorado. Can you take care of them? Hey, Clint, I've got some in Denver. Can you take care of them? So on and so forth. I just think we need to get that part figured out. So that's up for you guys. I want, to, I want to hear that talk next year right here. That's up to somebody else out there to figure out. I'm going to take care of that state employee group. I'm going to take care of ERISA law and put them behind you, and we're going to do all that. So I'm happy to take some questions. I hope. I'll try. Oh, boy. Is that really the top getter? Is the first one the top getter? Okay, so briefly describe the process of how to get Medicaid into direct primary care. I failed, so I don't know the process. Uh, I'll flat out tell you, though, I had the director of the product that wanted to pay for uh, direct primary care for the Medicaid recipients. So I went to the largest provider group of that Medicaid population and said, here's what we want to do. And the Medicaid provider organizations are in there and said, you know, our biggest issue is the ER utilizations. We have to figure out how to get on top of ER utilizations. And the provider group had no interest. So at this point in time, I failed. Can the DPC model work for a solo practitioner working without, sta without staff, a micro practice? Absolutely. There are people inside the audience that are proving that today. I've seen uh, Julie here. I know Julie, you here? Gunther, Julie, don't you run a little bit of a micro practice? How many employees do you have? Three. 
So you absolutely can do it. I was just talking to a doc the other day who's a family physician in Papillion, Nebraska. He's been working in ERs for the past two years, moonlighting to try and make a living because he actually almost went bankrupt trying to run his family practice clinic. So he is back approaching me, hey, can I get back in the game and do this in a direct primary care mode? And we're actually talking about a DPC micro practice for him where it's he and his wife. So it's absolutely a doable, de doable deal. How does your concierge business, oh boy, they change as I'm moving here. Okay, well, how does your concierge business differ from direct primary care? That's pretty simple. Um, I think of direct primary care, you're purchasing something in the medical practice. Concierge medicine means you just get access to me 24-7, but I'm billing insurance, all those other things. So that fee is kind of like that country club fee, but you still got to pay to go golf right? That's my concierge practice. Direct primary care for X amount of dollars a month, everything inside our clinic is covered. Plus you get 24 access, 7 access to the providers. Are the data point improvements that you show a factor of DPC or your unique practice of style? That's a great freaking question. I didn't practice it. I'm still running my concierge practice. And I'm still, I, I have a full concierge practice uh, myself. I'm taking care of, you know, somewhere between six and 700 patients in a concierge practice. So uh, Strata for me is about helping the other doctors in my community. It's my brainchild with my lovely wife, Kathy, who's really the business brains behind it. Um, and turning to some of the great resources like Brian Forrest when I was getting started and Josh and all the others from a standpoint of what is DPC and how does it work. But what I leveraged was my contacts. I take care of most of the CEOs in the city of Omaha. So I can go to a CEO and have a conversation. I don't work through the HR departments. I try to go to the CEO and have the CEO tell the HR department, hey, I just met with Joel. He's got a freaking phenomenal idea about what we could do to actually help our employee health and maybe actually get us to spend less money. Because one of the problems I promise you're going to have as you go do this at the employer level is getting through an HR department because when you start explaining this to them, sometimes it can really sound like a lot more work. Um, so we have plenty that we've gotten through where we're going through the HR department, but one of my goals from that standpoint for me and what I do to help is introduce them to the CEOs, go to the meetings and help with that. And then the other job I have is I I'm a physician educator. I, I mean, that's just my passion. That's what I've done. I, I spent 11 years at the University of Nebraska educating physicians. I won every teaching award you could win. I ran a board review course in Chicago for 11 years. I love educating physicians. That's what I bring to Strata Healthcare. I bring to Strata the teaching at that level of saying, listen, I know what you've been doing and it doesn't work. We have to do it differently. So I teach them my concierge model. This is how we do this. And it really, it isn't any different what we're asking you to do. The coverage is different, those kinds of things. Don't get me wrong. I'm not asking every one of my providers to be on 24-7. So, but the point is, the patients get access 24-7 to a provider, which all of you are already doing anyway. Whether you're paying for a call service or you're sharing your call with your partners, you're all already doing it anyway. So that part isn't any different. Um... If DPC practices use paper rather than an EMR, how do you mine the data? Whoa, ho, that'd be really freaking painful. Um, I probably wouldn't mine that data. Um, so, you know, we, once again, we have a lot of, um, of employer groups that we're taking care of. We still do all the biometrics data. We still try to get as much as we can. Uh, but, but there would obviously be some that uh, you can't do. Um, your comparison groups are not randomized. Aren't those who chose DPC more engaged in their health or better healthcare consumers? Um, you know, that might be. They were plumbers, and they were drain technicians, and they were people doing outbound phone calls. So if you think those people are highly educated in healthcare, it's possible, but they weren't. Uh, but what we did do was do a great job educating what we were going to deliver. Uh, the problem uh, I actually have in my study with Burton Plumbing is we now take care of 100% of the employees and I have no group to follow for comparison. Um, how did you develop an employer package with DPC without in integrating it with another insurance product? How did you develop an employer package with DPC? 
Well, that takes that employer that loves his employees enough to say, I want to do this because it's the right thing to do. So let me read that question one more time. How did you develop an employer package with DPC without integrating it with another insurance product? That's an add-on. It's a value add for the employees. The employees, because the, the guy loves them so much, he purchases direct primary care for them. Now, by the way, I do hope to show for that plumbing company that when he goes for reinsurance that we've dramatically reduced his insurance spend. And I expect him in the long run to actually be spending less money. But the problem is he's not self-insured. So this is, and for those of you who don't deal with any of this, I, I, that, that might sound crazy, but the, the problem is he can't get any of his data. So now we're going to have to work hard to try and get some of the data to see if the, we can get them to share what the spends were year to year so that maybe we can help save him money. Uh, let me go back to the beginning and see what's moved up. What EMR systems does Strata work with? Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to be talking about them out here, but I, we personally, what I like is Practice Fusion. Um, but we don't, I, I don't go into a doctor's office and say, hey, I'd love for you to affiliate with Strata, but you have to use this EMR. That's on us. I'm not going to make you change your EMR. Uh, how much money per member per month does Strata take of the DPC fee? We're not supposed to be talking money up here. I'd be happy to talk to anybody privately. Uh, uh, what is the average revenue? Uh, what attempt to publish your data in peer-reviewed journals? Actually, that's just where we're getting started. Who saw JAMA released yesterday? Huh? Make you want to vomit? Everybody's going to want to go home and read it tonight. I, I actually, I, I literally, I, I called my son last night who, who's my phenom with slides and all that. I mean, I, I don't do any of that crap. I can't do any of that. I'm so old school in that. Um, so I called my son last night uh, from the airport in Chicago when I saw the JAMA article, and I said, you've got to read this. I, I, can I change my talk? Can I incorporate this? But basically, Brown University, uh, a guy at a Brown University wrote, an, wrote a, a, a nice article about uh, direct primary care and why it will never be successful. And do you know why? Because we don't have any data, and you won't have any data. And that's why. So I will be writing a rebuttal. Um, one more. How long until the regulators make seen on-the-job injuries in direct primary care illegal, i.e., have to use the work comp benefit? Well, that's, I, you know what, I don't know. Um, I, Personally, I mean, think about yourself as the work comp benefit manager. Um, wouldn't everybody want to buy your product if you could show them the data of that company? I mean, there are a lot of ways you spin this the other direction and make it a positive. I, I'm a glass half full guy, always optimistic. Uh, so I, I never get concerned about how somebody takes something I did and did something that I think was fantastic and then wonder, well, what are those naysayers going to say? I could give a shit less. That, that's probably where Jeff and I would agree the most. I personally have no tattoos. Um, eh, but um, it, it's not Jeff that I wouldn't get one. I'll, I'll get one with you, bud. You just got to pay for it. I don't have the money. <laughs> I'm spending it on getting data for DPC. Okay, so I think I'm done. So thank you all very much. Uh, feel free to pull me aside for any questions, email me, anything like that. Love to talk to you more about data and direct primary care.